Sherry's cousin, Steve Fritz, was a member of the 1996 U.S. Olympic track and field team. He was a decathlete, and as you can uh, perhaps see in the caption here, uh, he got fourth place in the Olympics. I only met him once. Uh, it was at a, a family uh, wedding. He was a soft-spoken guy, but um, he had a little bit of a bearing about him that suggested, um, yes, I can run faster than you can. I can run farther than you can. I can jump higher than you can. I can, you know, I mean, he was, he was, uh, he was quite an athlete. It was pretty obvious. Now, chances are you don't remember the name Steve Fritz because he got fourth in uh, an event in which an American, Dan O'Brien, uh, won the gold medal. It actually all came down to the last event, uh, the 1500 meter. And Steve was in third place going into the last event. Um, there was, uh, Dan O'Brien was in first, and there was this young East German, well, young German who um, uh, had sort of just was having the meat of his life. He had like seven PRs in, in the previous nine events, and he, had, he was not expected to do as well as he was doing. He was in second. And Steve was in third, and then there was somebody pretty close behind him in fourth. Um, but going into the last event, the way the decathlon is scored, it's, it was possible that Steve could win it all. And, and he was a pretty good uh, metric miler, and uh, Dan O'Brien was pretty bad at this event. As a matter of fact, O'Brien hated the 1500 meter. He had been known to cry before it even began. And so... Um, uh, we were all excited, his family, because as you can imagine, I mean, oh my goodness, it's, uh, this, is, this is family. Now, I, I should qualify this. Um, Sherry's uh, grandfather died before Sherry's father was born. Uh, and, and then uh, her grandmother remarried Steve Fritz's grandfather who had been widowed. So they were not blood cousins. And I, of course, don't factor into this equation at all, but I was trying to figure out how some of the whole, yes, we're related to an Olympic decathlete because we're great athletes, you know, that whole vibe, I could play that off. But um, it was exciting, and, uh, and it, it all comes down to the final, it, final lap, really, because Steve goes out. He makes a serious play uh, to win it all, and in the third lap, he opens up a pretty significant lead. It's a four-lap race, pretty significant lead on the rest of the field. And uh, the announcers, who had really been only paying attention throughout the, 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 the two days, were really focused on O'Brien, and all of a sudden they're waking up and they're going, wow, uh, Fritz is, is way out there. I mean, he's gonna, he could win this whole thing if he can keep this up. But in the end, he hits the wall, and uh, the, the pack catches him, and, uh, and a number of people pass him, and, and at the very end, he, um, he ends up losing the bronze medal. He doesn't win the gold or the silver, and he loses the bronze. And fourth place uh, in the Olympics is not the place that you want to finish. Uh, for what it's worth... His point total would have won him the gold medal in the previous two Olympic decathlons. And his second day score, it's a two-day event, five events the first day, five the second. His second day score was an Olympic record until just recently. Um, but he missed an Olympic medal by a whisper. I mean, really, it's by 20 points, which is nothing. It's, it's you know, 6,000 points, and he lost by 20. So... Um, I called him this week um, to ask him to reflect on that because it felt to me like there was something there that uh, ties in even to our study in Jonah. And so I'm going to circle back to that in a minute. Let me uh, circle back to the beginning of Jonah and just remind you of what we have covered so far. This is, uh, I think, the fifth or sixth sermon in this series. In the first couple chapters, we've established that Jonah was uh, a reluctant Hebrew 8th century prophet who was... Uh, told by God to go to the, the Jews' uh, enemies, the Assyrians, and to tell uh, the, the Assyrians in Nineveh that they needed to repent. And Jonah doesn't have any interest in doing this. He doesn't want to help, quote-unquote, the enemy. And so he makes a break for it. But 
Um, he doesn't get very far. You can't really run from God. And uh, in this case, it leads him to being in a ship uh, in a storm. And then he gets thrown overboard and he sinks to the bottom. And then he's swallowed by this great fish. Uh, and it's not until this point, and this was uh, last week, it's not until this point that Jonah repents. He cries, uncle. Or at least he appears to. He thanks God uh, for rescuing his life uh, from certain death. Literally from the belly of death is the way the Hebrew reads. Um, at which point the fish spits him out on dry land. And we pick up then with Jonah chapter 3. Which is where we're at today. So I've made other points. I've noted that this is really not a fish story. And that it's a powerful literary work with all kinds of nuances. And that it drips with irony. And that it points to Jesus. But... Uh, let's look at Jonah chapter 3. So, then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim the message I give to you. Now, both the uh, NASB, New American Standard um, Bible, and the ESV, English Standard Version, have the word arise, uh, which I think is a real miss by the NIV team to leave it out. They didn't consult me, but remember... There's this idea, arise and go to Nineveh, arise and pray. Now it's again, arise and go to Nineveh. But Jonah keeps going down, down uh, to Tarshish, down into the ship, down to sleep, down to the bottom uh, of uh, the ocean. So Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord. Okay, so uh, second time he's going to get it right. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Uh, now, Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. There's several different interpretations that go on here. Uh, it's obviously, it's a significant city. Uh, there's some sense that when it says three days to, to, to go uh, through it means you can't really do Chicago in a day, right? You can't take in uh, the... The Field Museum and uh, the Art Institute and, you know, go to the Tower. You can't really do the Museum of Science and Industry. You can't do Chicago um, in a day. It's going to take three days or more. Uh, so there's, there's that idea that's being conveyed here. The other idea is that it's just huge. It's just a massive city. Of course, they're not driving. They're walking. Uh, and there's some historical records that suggest that there's like 60 miles of walls that encompass this. And so we've got that. It's just physically big. And then the third idea is that maybe it's not just referring to Nineveh. Like when people refer to Chicago, you don't know. Are they referring to Chicago proper? Like just within the city limits? Or are they referring to the greater Chicago metropolitan area? When we moved here uh, to <laughs> Chicago 20-some uh, years ago, our boys were small, and the third day we had been, we live in Lake Bluff, the third day we had been at our home in Lake Bluff, we said to the boys, I think they were, you know, 11, 7, and 4, and we said, we're, today we're going to go into Chicago. And uh, one of them said, but we're in Chicago. And we said, no, not really, we're, we're in Lake Bluff, we're going to go into Chicago. And they go, we told all our friends, back in Washington, where we had been, they, we told all our friends we were moving to Chicago. And we go, right. They go, but we don't live in Chicago? And we go, well, no. They go, we lied to our friends? You lied to our friends? We're like, no. So it's, it's just complicated. So, so maybe it's just the entire Nineveh area. We don't know. What we do know is that um, uh, it's, it is a big, prominent city. It's an important place, and Jonah is sent there to preach, and he is sent to preach to, to tell them enough is enough. They've got to stop. They're looting, marauding, raping, pillaging, burning. They, they were wicked people. Uh, that was their reputation, and it was time to end. So uh, Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. Now, uh, I have to say, uh, this is really challenging to imagine. I mean, many people just hate public speaking in general. Uh, I, I'm sort of used to it by now. But the idea of going into Nineveh and then just sort of standing on a street corner and saying, hey, 
you're vile and wicked and God is going to strike you down. I mean, it, this just seems like a bad idea. Like, okay, I'm going to last. I'm a Jew going into Assyria. This is like, I'm a Jew going into, you know, Hitler's Germany in the 1940s and I'm going to start to, to speak against the Nazis. I'm, I'm not going to last long. Right, I mean, Jonah's uh, got to think somebody's going to rip my arm off and then beat me over the head with it. I'm not going to survive uh, very long. But uh, to his surprise, the Ninevites believed God. I mean, this is <laughs> this. We'll see later on that this is one of the things he's actually worried about. Uh, but it can't be what he was expecting. He has to expect that they're just simply not going to, they're not going to pay attention to him. Um, as a speaker, I can tell you that uh, seldom do things go better than I expect. Occasionally. I mean, there are times when I feel very unprepared for a sermon or a presentation, and it, it feels as though, you know, God shows up and things happen, and I'm, I'm sort of a bystander. That does occasionally happen, and I'm very, very thankful when it does. For the most part, uh, things go about as well as I expect or worse. Uh, and that's, by the way, that's, that's preaching. That's also when I was a consultant. I remember uh, there were times when I thought, okay, this isn't going to go well. I had a police department, uh, one of my clients one time, and I had to deliver some hard news to them, and I remember thinking, hmm, uh, they've got guns, like I don't, I don't like this assignment. Um, there are other times when I sort of thought things would go well and they started to go really poorly. I, had, I was trying to merge three libraries at a university together, a music library, a science library, and a general library. And uh, I have a presentation to make. They don't want to merge and I'm, I'm sort of facilitating this merger process. And it, it got really ugly. Uh, there was, I had a, uh, one of my staff and I were together on this, and it starts to go really south. And I remember thinking, <laughs> are you kidding me? This is how my life ends. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be going to be killed by a bunch of mad librarians. I mean, that's, that's just embarrassing. Uh, so seldom do things go better than expected. Sometimes they go worse. This time. They go better than he had to be thinking. Now, historians note that a number of things have been happening in the area just prior to this. Uh, there had been a uh, plague, there had been a famine, there had been some eclipses. And so th it's possible that, that God in his providence had, I mean, he can do it however he's going to prepare people. He had been preparing the Assyrians for uh, a foreign prophet to march into town and to say, uh, you're in trouble. They probably had a sense that this was coming. Um, but he said they, they believe in God. And so a fast was proclaimed. And all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. So sackcloth, burlap, gunny sack, right? I mean, this is, this is you know, get out, of your, uh, get out of your Armani suit. Take off your silk robes. Uh, just understand that you're now, um, you are... Uh, going to put on the worst looking clothes you can imagine and you're going to sit in ashes and rub ashes in your hair and on your faces. So we just had Ash Wednesday. Uh, the ashes represent, uh, you know, darkness. They represent death. They represent, you know, we're frail. From, we were made from dust to dust we will return. We're sort of, it, it's all a very humbling kind of experience. And they are, they are doing this. Uh, when Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. Uh, this is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals. We, we have no record of the Jews ever instituting a fast that included animals. I mean, they're not moral agents. They, do, they don't sin. They just, they, they do what they do. Do not let people or animals, herds or flocks taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. But let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. So the way this is formatted uh, suggests that part of what the king might have been actually concerned about was that they were going to do violence to each other. 
which violent societies, violent towards outsiders, can sometimes uh, turn on each other. Um, so that's possible, but uh, he says, who knows, this is the king, who knows, God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. So uh, this is a significant act of repentance uh, that, that they take, the Ninevites take. And when God saw uh, what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Now, for what it's worth, um, this is a little, it, the text is a little vague. Uh, it doesn't appear as though Jonah uh, called on them with sort of full disclosure about who God was. The passage uses the term um, God, G-O-D. Uh, that's translation out of the Hebrew of the, of the Hebrew term Elohim. When Jonah is talking, in, in the book of Jonah, when they're talking about God, Yahweh, they're using the term Lord. So there's some suggestion that, I mean, some people say, what Jonah did was lead a revival and everybody sort of uh, comes to faith and repents and is, is uh, humble before the Lord and gets right with God. Um, we don't have any indication that they destroy their idols. We don't have any indi indication that they actually, you know, sort of move towards the Lord. What we have an indication of is that they were scared they were going to get wiped out and they relented. Uh, by the way, there's another... so. So there's uh, a group of people that, that suggest that uh, Jonah uh, did preach the gospel and, uh, you know, they just sort of say it's a big revival. There's others that say, you know, Jonah didn't do any of that. He just did social action. He just, you know, cared for them. And that's what we need to do. We need to lead with that. Okay, no. <laughs> so again, we're called to both. We are called to both. But this was not social action either. He told them that they were going to be judged and, and held accountable by God. So um, the text is a little vague. We're not uncertain exactly what happened. But what we know is that, um, is that, that uh, the people turned, which is what Jonah feared was going to happen. He wants them wiped out. And uh, we're going to see next week in Jonah chapter 4 uh, that Jonah is going to sort of cop an attitude and going to go in a different direction. So I thought, um, just uh, by way of, of reflecting on this passage, I thought about talking about judgment, um, which is sort of enormously unpopular in this culture. Now, I'll say things are, are shifting on this front. It used to be that, you know, in, in my sort of understanding of what was going on, there was uh, the, the, the call was we should not be judging each other. Judgment is bad. Uh, everybody's free to do whatever they want to do. Uh, and then we sort of moved in from that into a little bit more of a harshness on that. And, and, and the, the joke was people are uh, very judgmental of people who are judgmental where people are very intolerant of anyone that's intolerant and just sort of pointing out some of the ironies that were going on. We've, we've sort of in the last 18 months have moved into a different period, this whole cancel culture, in which people are now very open about saying, no, we are going to judge, we are going to sort of hold people accountable to a standard. The standard is changing all the time, but we're going to hold people accountable to a standard. So I thought about talking about judgment because, uh, look, there is a God, there are absolute standards, we are accountable for our life, we are accountable for what we do, we are going to be held accountable, there is a final audit. And so I thought about talking about that, but in fact I've talked about that many times, I'll talk about it again. I decided to go in a, in a different direction. There are, um, there, are, there are two things that I want to be sure you get today. The first one is an understanding that the book of Jonah is about repentance. The book of Jonah is about repentance. It is not a fish story. It's a repentance story. Right? Jonah is calling on the people to repent. Jonah has to repent. Uh, and it, 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 is, it is woven. Once you step back and you look at it, you realize... 
This is what we're being called to do. And it's not just the book of Jonah. I mean, the Gospels are going to open up with John the Baptist, who is calling on people to repent and prepare for the Lord. The first things that Jesus is going to say in sort of his public ministry is repent and prepare for the kingdom of God is at hand. And, and we're, we're going to see that, that this, this is the first uh, of the 95 theses that Luther will tack uh, when he tacks his 95 theses under the door of the castle in Germany. The first, the first thesis is about an ongoing call to repentance. Repentance is, is to be our posture moving through life. Repentance is to be uh, an ongoing activity. There is a sense in which uh, we become a Christ follower. We become adopted in the family of God. We are justified on the basis of the work of Christ, when we repent, when we turn, the Hebrew word shuv, when we turn and go in the other direction, when we, when we acknowledge our sin, when we call out to God, when we turn from an independent path back towards God. So repentance is a big theme in the book of Jonah. And I want to encourage you to cultivate a, a soft, reflective humble heart uh, to, to understand that, that uh, we all have blind spots and uh, we need to, we need to uh, just be soft to the, to the ways that we are causing problems for other people. So first thing, the book of Jonah is about repentance. The second thing, the last thing that I want to say, takes us a little bit off script, and it goes back to uh, Steve Fritz. And it's uh, more of a general comment, but it, it just it feels to me, like as, uh, as a pastor here in, um, in the North Shore of, of Chicago, uh, after a week of snow and bitter cold, after uh, almost 12 months, of a COVID uh, pandemic and sheltering in place. After nearly a year of racial tension and frustration. After a contentious election that was followed by an assault on the Capitol, that was followed by uh, another impeachment, that was followed by hundreds of thousands uh, of hours of acrimonious political theater. Like after, after a year in which some of you have lost jobs and many of us have lost opportunities, uh, I want to encourage you to keep putting one foot in front of the other. Uh, I want to encourage you to, uh, to just keep taking the next faithful step, even if you're exhausted, even if you're weary, even if you're, you're feeling a bit defeated. I want to encourage you um, that... We're going to get through this, but you have to keep moving forward. So um, it occurred to me, as I said, that uh, there was something about resilience that would have been a challenge for Jonah uh, to have to sort of you know, pick himself up, clean himself off after he's been uh, through a shipwreck and, and nearly drowning and being in the the belly of death and all of that, that uh, he would have to decide he was going to go do this hard thing that he didn't want to do. Um, and as we'll see next week, he really didn't want to do it, but he does it. Uh, and it'll take him a while to get where he needs to be. He's going to get knocked back again. But, but there was some bit of resilience in Jonah that, that as I sort of contemplated what it would have been like to be him, um, I thought, yeah, he, he, as much as I'm knocking the guy, he got back up. And uh, that's what led me to call Steve. So, um, again, you don't go to the Olympics to get fourth place. And so uh, I called him and I said, look, I'm just curious. I mean, again, we, we hardly know each other. But I said, I, I'm just curious how you reflect back on that moment, you know, 20 plus years ago. When, uh, when you got fourth by, by the smallest margin in the Olympics. And he said that um, he knew as soon as he crossed the finish line because the, the coach of the guy that had been in fourth place who had, who had passed him towards the end, uh, there was like a five seconds. Uh, if he had to beat Steve by five seconds and he says, I knew it was really close, but he said, I, I was watching the coach, that coach, that coach had a stopwatch. And as soon as I crossed, he jumped up and down. He was celebrating. I knew that that meant 
his athlete had gotten third and that I had fallen to fourth. And uh, so he said I was, you know, okay, I was immediately aware of this. And, and he said, so I, uh, I walked under the infield of the track and he said I sat down there uh, to just sort of take inventory of what had just happened. And he said, uh, I realized, okay, you know, a defining moment here. What are you going to do? And he said, I realized I, I, I did everything I could. <laughs> like, like I, I, he goes, it wasn't a perfect meet for me. Some things went against me that shouldn't have. He goes, I didn't do everything that I might have. It wasn't the perfect meet. Uh, but okay, I did my best. I gave it everything I had. And, and this is where I'm at. And he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to celebrate this. Uh, I'm going to take the next faithful step. He says, I decided, I got up, and I went over to congratulate the other athletes who had won medals. And um, he said, I, and I moved forward. And he said, I haven't, um, I haven't, I haven't really dwelled on it. So he, he came back to the, the States. He became a track and field coach at K-State for 20-some years, and then a basketball coach. And uh, um, yeah, so he's married and has a family. And and he says, I just decided I couldn't, uh, you know, I couldn't not do the, the right thing. And I wasn't going to let this discouragement define me. And so I think there's a message there <laughs> in February in Chicago at this particular year when so many things are going wrong. That uh, sometimes uh, the way forward is just to be resilient and to just do the next faithful thing. So Jonah chapter 3. There's a message here about repentance, soft heart, and there's a message about resilience. Let me pray for us. Father, I want to, uh, I want to pray especially for those who are tired and discouraged and weary and frustrated for any one of all kinds of reasons uh, of challenges. I want to pray, Father, for a sense of your favor. I want to pray for a sense of clarity. I want to pray for some energy and some resilience for some breaks. Uh, and I want to pray also for, for those in that spot and for them and everyone else and for myself. I want to pray for that posture of humility, that soft, uh, repentant heart that is able to see the ways in which we have fallen short and that glories uh, in Christ and your love and your mercy, your care for us and uh, recognizes our own um, complicity with sin and, and moves forward from a spirit of humility and repentance. Guide us to that end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.